Hi there, I'm Mark Isero, and welcome to Article Club, where we read, annotate, and discuss great articles on race, education, and culture. This month, I'm happy to say that we've been focusing on How to Name Your Black Son in a Racist Country by Tyrone Florizard. And this Sunday, a good number of us are going to be coming together to talk about this outstanding piece. Before that, though, I wanted to make sure that all of us get to hear Mr. Florizard. He was extremely generous to speak to me and Sarai a couple weeks ago. It was a gift to hear him talk about a number of topics, including how he approaches writing, how this piece came about, what he thinks about his name, how he understands his relationship with his father, and what he thinks about the immigration industrial complex. Here's the interview. First of all, Tyrone, thank you so much for doing Article Club. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. I'm looking forward to this combo. Yeah, Sarai and I and all the article clubbers have so many questions for you. The first one is like, <laughs> like, how did this all, like, how did this all happen? You know, like Roxanne Gay, your essay, like, how did this all happen for you? Yeah, so I guess I should start with the, how I got the idea. I was in my graduate program and it was a writing course that I had with this woman named Nancy Summers. My first writing class I had ever taken. And it was, it was just a writing workshop that we had. It was about our first writing workshop ever. And we read an essay called How to Make a Slave by Gerald Walker. And that essay completely blew me out of the water, that opening paragraph. And the way he told that story was just so gripping. And I was like, oh, okay, I have to write something like this, like in some oh. form of fashion. And in this class, we had to write a final assignment or write, final, write a final paper. And I had caught COVID. And so, you know, I was like, at home, you know, remote, you know, trying to stay away from my, my family and friends to protect them. And I'm thinking about what story I want to talk about. And something that I keep coming back to throughout my life was the story of my name and how I, you know, how, how it came into my name. And so I decided to just write that opening line. Do not argue with your, you know, do not argue with your wife when it's time to sign the birth certificate, you know? So yeah, yeah, that's how I got there. That's amazing. Yeah, that first paragraph and the first line yeah. That just blew us away. Uh, Sarai and I were just talking about how much you packed in. And also, the like, I felt tension right from the beat, like that there was something yeah. going to be happening. Do you remember how you wrote that first paragraph? No, I don't. I don't really. I, I just know that it's literally modeled after I took the craft and imitated Gerald Walker in that essay. And that essay, again, is called How to Make a Slave. And in it, he does the similar, the same thing. He uses the imperative voice to tell his story. And so similarly, I use the imperative, you know, the, the do not or the, you know, the mm -hmm. command to share two stories, you know, which is like so profound. I always love to ask every person we interview about like process and about like yeah. where, you know, how things come about. And the first questions I have is like, you said it was your first writing workshop. Like, do you have, like, what are your other experiences with writing? And also I love, you know, talking about how this was from another essay and using that imperative voice. And there's also some other things that you do like stylistically and like technically, like with the repetition, with the passage of time in the piece. And so I guess my question is like, what is your writing style without that influence? And how did your writing style kind of shift as you were trying to, you know, kind of follow this form? Yeah, the only thing, I wouldn't say the only thing, this course gave me a bunch of tools. So one of the pieces of feedback I got at the end of this workshop was that like, Tyrone, the, the what we did for you is just give you the names of the tools of craft. You already had them. Mm. And to, as someone as an aspiring writer here that like was so really humanizing, you know, to know that like, yeah. I've, I've been doing this since I was a yeah. kid. You know, and to hear these prof writing professionals say that, like, we just provided you the names of them and maybe taught you how to use them a little bit deeper, mm -hmm. but you always had them. And I was just mm -hmm. like, wow, like, who would have thought, you know, this little kid who had a green velvet diary <laughs> in middle school would, would uh, hear this from, you know, professional folks. And so it really starts from, yeah, like elementary and middle school. I just had, I kept a, I kept a journal to write in it. Not often, you know, and I called it, um, TGE, the great escape is what I called it. And so that's, that's how I approach writing. Writing always for me was a time and space to just get away from everything and to just be with my own thoughts. And I felt like I could use writing as a vehicle to cut through the noise really. So wow. yeah, I think that's the best way to describe it, that, that, that the world and life is too noisy and I use writing to turn to turn the volume down and to make sense of it. And going to that course really allowed me to be more intentional with the writing. 
you know, like, yeah. And this topic was something that was hard to write about, like, but something I learned in that writing workshop was that like, we just have to face the the truth. You know, we have to tell the truth of our lives because in doing so, in getting more personal, we get universal, you know, and I, and I think that speaks mm. to the essay. So wait, 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 you just said the topic <laughs> was hard to write about. And I'm like, which topic? Because <laughs> there's just, so like, what do you feel was the hardest? Was it like the relationship with your dad? Was it about the naming? Is it about assimilation? Is it about whiteness and blackness? Like what, what was, you don't have to say the hardest, but what was like significant to you? The hardest, and so what I mean by that, when I say the hardest is nothing, and you're right, because it is a lot packed into this essay. I guess the point, the, the hard part was um, just facing the truth, just yeah. looking in the mirror and like acknowledging what I saw. That's hard. You know, that's hard. <laughs> and so that meant digging in and acknowledging hard truths, you know, and cringing, you know, like cringing a lot. <laughs> about who I was and how I how I came to be that person how I'm growing out of that and how we're you know this is a lifelong journey and so that was probably the hard part is just looking in the mirror you know wow that's like I mean I definitely want to also like you know have put a pin in like what you said about the personal being universal and I think because you know a lot of the folks we work with in this article club are educators you know and we're definitely trying to always make sure that we're facilitating authentic experiences and writing and stuff. And that it comes with deep truths, you know, like you can't just, even the question, like, how are you today <laughs> is going to make something really extremely deep for everybody, you know? Yeah. And especially when we're trying to facilitate writing experiences, that's why I think it's so interesting that this piece came about in a writing, you know, class because facilitating yeah. authentic writing is something that we all strive towards, but you had said the personal is universal. And I definitely found that like, that's what was so cringe, cringeworthy about, you know, seeing these imperatives and seeing a relationship to what you've written is like, oh, like, oh, like when, you know, the, the line, when you said, oh, something called the Fulbright and some place called Malaysia. And then like, after, after he looked it up, he calls you back to tell you he's, he's proud. And I'm like, oh my God, like that is, that is something that feeling, you know, of only having been validated through the outside, you know, world's experiences, especially dealing with like immigration, dealing with racism, like that is really hard. And so all the, the things that you brought up, all the things that were packed in this, it was like left, it was like gut punch left and right. I was like- There's an opportunity to like expand it, you know? Like yeah. Something, I can really sit more with this, but I, you know, I didn't, I didn't think, uh, there is space, there is space. And I think I, I wanna, I do wanna re revisit this, this piece yeah. that's been in my life. Yeah it seems like this is something that you could expand, like all the moments, like it was so, the fact that it was written in an imperative, like it was written in a list form, like it didn't give any rise to explanation, which I thought was very powerful. Like all of a sudden in this, in the piece, like it goes from being my wife to my ex-wife. And you know that there's like a huge shift there, but you're like, nope, we're keeping going with the list. Like we have to keep going. And mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, there were so many things like that, like you could take one of those stories and expand it into the narrative like that you what you're talking about make that personal even more universal the way the more you expand it so yeah I, I appreciate the way that this piece was technically written and I appreciate the the ways that like you you kind of made a story while still centering like the black experience sometimes yeah. when narratives like this are told it's like the racism is centered as opposed to our experience with racism being centered or experience with like familial conflict or relational tension and I really appreciate how you managed like you managed the story about your father but you managed to center yourself there you know and I think that's really powerful yeah I appreciate that you know and I think I've been on a journey I guess you can call it a journey trying to get people to understand that that ex that experience is rigorous and valid data point yes and people often people often think of science and and work as objective and apolitical and it's just like that's not that's never been true and that our experience our experience with you know any form of oppression or ex an ex experience generally is a valid form or a valid epistemology right mm -hmm. a valid form of knowing and expressing uh truth right personally yeah. i believe can you say a little bit more about the religion piece because it begins and then also I feel the most, like it, it, it's the most you write about. I felt very complex with you, with uh, religion, with your, with your father. Can you say a little bit more about that? For sure. My family is very religious. Um, 
And yeah, religion is at the center. And so particularly around the circumstances of my birth, you know, my grandmother often says like, what does she say? She says something along the lines of, you know, who else died and rose again, right? <laughs> right. And this and this kind of this idea that like when I was born, you know, I was kept in the hospital for three days. Right. That's the time that Jesus was you know, crucified for. He rose again on the last day and I came home on Easter. Right. And so for my family, who's really religious, they saw that as an opportunity like, oh, like we must like do everything we can to support him and like, you know, raise him as such. Right. I don't want to sound, you know, any don't want to make any comparisons here. I'm not saying that I'm Jesus at all. My grandmother, like, <laughs> definitely walks this walks this earth like her grandson, you know what I mean, has some, has some crazy religious ties. And so that's the, really the genesis of the article or essay. It stems from that story, hearing stories growing up from my grandmother. Like, you got, like, anytime I, like, acted up, you know, acted up, maybe talked back once, <laughs> like, no, you can't be doing that because, and so I wanted to expand on that story. So what does that mean to come from a re super religious family where that's the case, but then have someone in my family who, like, you know, we're talking about my father here, where, you know, the opening, the ending paragraph is like, your God is work, everything else is sacrilege. My father is the hardest working person I know. Like, if anyone, if I could describe John Henryism, uh, like, if I could use any archetype to describe it, it would be my father. I, yeah. And honestly, I sometimes I fear that my father, you know, might be the next victim of that, you know, just working so hard yeah. and so much, so much so that, he would take my siblings and I to the movies and we would turn and he's sleeping, you know, just because he hasn't had an opportunity to sleep. But what was important to him was spending time with his kids. And so, yeah, those two things, like this super religious grandmother and my father, who's religious, like, I think, I think the term is called uh, keister, you know, he'll, he'll go to, you know, church or on Christmas and Easter and also every holiday or every birthday to say, say a prayer for us. So I don't want to, you know, to downplay the, the role of religion in his life, but work comes first, work comes. And that's always been the case for him. And he, he'll, he'll, my father loves us so much and he doesn't understand this. I think this is the, when we talk about immigration, how that conversation unfolds. My father can tell me with a straight face, like he'll say, I think work is more important than family because if I can't work, I can't take care of you. Mm. And in my mind, I'm like, wow, no one would say that, right? Like if you think about it, when people talk about work and family, they say, oh, family's the most important thing. But here my father is with all the love in his heart and saying, nah, work is more important because if I can't work, I can't take care of my family. And so that's the kind of frame, that's how he sees the world and that's how he operates. And that's kind of how our relationship you know, works. And so you talk about, so I use religion throughout the piece to really, to talk to, you know, to, to grapple with those things, those two ideas. Yeah. Mm. But like, yeah. Wow. Mm. This is relatable content because like, when you think about it, like, you know, people have that logic, but then they, when they go into talking about specifics of their family, like I need to do this, this, and this for my family. It's like so evident out of the sacrifice that parents make. It's so that kids can make a different choice. But yeah. then often those choices, they're like, they clash hella with like the parents' idea of what is right. So it's like this eternal like frustration. And that was another thing that I definitely cringed with like throughout the piece. I'm just like, oh, oh. Like, when will like, when will the tension ever be resolved? Like, when is it? And, you know, if I keep coming back to the fact that like the state or like, or, you know, like the, the society's pressure, because one of the things I think you did really like awesomely too was show at the end like your dad would have made different choices if it wasn't for it like with the line yeah I think you had it repeated a couple of times like I would have made a different choice I would have named you a different name like I would have done those things if it wasn't for having to grapple with all the ways that racism you know made our relationship so complex and that you know that that's one of the hardest things to grapple with at the end of the story because you we, like that tension won't ever be resolved you know like there's still there's a type of wonder and a type of hope at the end of the thing, but it's it's like a deep release, like knowing you're going to have to go back and fight that battle another day. You know what I mean? Like it's parental tension is it's in the air. Like, what is that? Like what I tried to capture in this essay is like the never ending tension, right? Like what what is this essay, if it's not just the, the, you know, cut and paste story of parent and child relationship because I I will never tell my kid that work is more important than family I will tell my kid family is more important than work right but here we are this, these generational differences and I'm sorry Mark I feel like I didn't answer your question before about the religion piece fully and I will say that like the point was that particularly that paragraph where I talk about you know the Gabriel sending Mary uh, an angel God sending sent the angel Gabriel to Mary to instruct her to name her son Jesus I was at a time when I was thinking about like you know 
We'll talk about what's in the name later, I imagine. But what I'm trying to get, I thought this religion tie was perfect to my story, right? Because God did name his son Jesus, knowing that he will end up dying. But when it comes to someone like my father, <laughs> you know, that paragraph I talk mm. about, like my dad would have been like, nah, get out of here, man. I got things to do. Like my kids have, my kid has a future, right? And that, and the point was that no matter what, it didn't matter. Nothing could have saved Jesus from that ultimate fate. Right. And so that the name didn't matter. And that's yeah. what I want. And that's the kind of point, the, the ultimate point of the essay, right? That we get to a place where, where we can go into these kinds of decisions, not really burdened or held back by racism or any kind of oppression that like hinders us from making humanizing decisions. So I, I hope that better answers your question. I just thought it just fits so perfect. Yeah, it totally fits. And then also how you talk about Austin, for example, yeah. mm -hmm. or Ty or T and the yeah. nice white girlfriend. And yeah. all of the different with name. And apparently you're a Romeo fan of Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> I, because he gave me a tool, like a, a path to like, oh, wait, I can get rid of this, you know, right? Because he was trying to get rid of his name so badly. And so for a young kid, angsty kid, you know, thinking about, you know, being a, a Black kid at a predominantly white Catholic school and have struggling with sense of identity and self, Romeo gave me a way out. You know, Romeo was ready to give give his thing thing away. And I was, oh, maybe I can give a give mine up too, you know. Mm. And it's really childlike. You know, obviously I I I own my name now and I make sure everyone puts respect on it. And I don't try to, and I definitely don't allow people to call me Ty anymore. I definitely use that as a as a tool to disarm white folk, mm. specifically white folk. Like, right? oh, just call me Ty. Don't worry about calling me Tyrone, you know. And I say I can say that confidently now, but it gave me so much brought me so much despair you know once I started coming to where I am now you know just like damn I really let those people talk to me any kind of way <laughs> you know I really let them call me out my name like I facilitated that you know and I regret it deeply but I think it's important it's an important part of my journey and part of um, an important part of my story so yeah in the piece when you start talking about Malaysia it's like it's the only chance I feel like your dad could have done something different and then he doesn't really but then you don't talk about it too much in the piece about how much Malaysia transform I mean you do yeah. but can you say a little bit more about being there it seems like it just really opened up and led you to a deeper truth um, for you and your identity is that is that right Yes, for sure. I'd say so. Yeah, I try to make the focus. So I use Malaysia as a tool or a vehicle to, to talk about my growth, but I didn't want to spend too much time there. But I definitely, again, like I said, hope to revisit the piece. But yeah, so Malaysia was a real, a real transformative experience. I was, you know, as you say, as I wrote in the essay, I was the only Tyrone in my cohort, you know, and be, and the only black person in my school community. I was an English teaching assistant. So I you know, held facilitated English language programming for, for students, among other things, and being met with various isms. So, you know, for example, like I remember my first week, like there was a student who came up to me and said, like, he said, he asked me, like, are you a Negro? And I was like, I was so shook. I was shook. God, how exhausting. And I couldn't, and I wouldn't ever like try to you know, crucify that kid, you know, like I would never shame him because he just doesn't know. So I was like, uh, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I said the correct term is like African-American, like, and I don't even consider it like, I consider, I just say black. I don't even say like, you know, African-American among other things, but I told him that and he, he was like, okay, you know, kept going on. And I was like, dang, like first week I'm here, for, I'm in for a long ride. And, you know, facing other instances where it had, you know, teachers, um, again, never malicious, any malicious intent. And that's kind of something I also appreciated and learned and grew into, you know, folks were saying, oh, racism can't exist because Barack is president right like they tell me that doesn't make sense right and so having tough conversations with people in my community about what that actually means and so it was in that space that you know that I was given the opportunity to really sit with it all like being really away from my family and away from the U.S. context you know I think I I wouldn't make this strong of a parallel but I'm thinking of Baldwin, who had literally had to leave in order to figure it out. You know, I didn't get to do the, the work that I wanted to do in order to figure it out. I was teaching and had a, and I need to support myself through that fellowship. But I went there to figure it out, you know, and I came out on the other side, coming up with what this essay was talking about, that it really doesn't matter. You yeah. know, and that like, if I have a kid, I'm going to choose the blackest name ever, because <laughs> at the end, it doesn't matter. 
you know, what matters is that I love and support this kid and that just put him on game, you know, if that makes sense. But yeah, yeah. that's, that's the biggest thing Malaysia really I took away with. I think like the, like the concept of, because to be honest, like there's a set of experiences, like I've had the black in Asia experience and you could yeah. say like black in Asia experience and people would know what the fuck you're talking about. Like, that's yeah. like, that's an archetype. You know what I'm saying? Like that is a situation that pe- that sure. folks of color have to do that doesn't always come up, you know, but it's one of those things in the hat of the reasons why it doesn't matter what you name your kid, because no matter what, they're still going to be in a space is someone's going to not put any respect on their identity or anything like that. And yeah. I feel like that's one of the things that's like, by the end of your essay, I was like, okay, like I got the Jesus reference. I understood like what was going on with the, the, the way it's technically written, like in imperatives the imperative just like keep going and keep going and keep going. And what do you do in a, with a list like that? Like with a list that doesn't exhaust itself, like you just have to say, fuck this list because like, yeah. no matter what, you know, like no matter what, like you're going to do something wrong or you're going to do something like so-called inappropriate that's going to warrant some kind of like disrespect, sure, sure. you know, yeah. coming from the larger society. But uh, yeah, I super appreciate the ways that like you were writing this, like the archetypes could change, you know, like there could be a shift, like, We don't have to, it doesn't have to be our college experiences or whatever, or our Malaysia experiences that teach us that it's okay for, to make people call us by the right name. You know, like maybe that doesn't have to be a universal experience or an archetypal experience for what it means to be black in America, you know, like, even though I, yeah, even though I cringed throughout this essay by the end, like I was like, all right, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Cause I just, I can't give so many fucks. Like I cannot. You know, exactly. that's interesting you say that. And I think this work, this essay, it doesn't do this completely. But, you know, what it seeks to do is upend like the immigration industrial complex, you know, that like that's the tool like they use, you know, I'd say, you know, first gen black immigrants use this that, you know, the language of middle class America to, to really do harm to people yeah. who look like them. Right. That like it. And so if Le- it can happen to LeBron James, right, it can happen to the, a, do- a black doctor. It can happen to anyone. So don't, so like, it it seeks to disrupt that, like disrupt that logic that like, oh, as long as you're educated, as long as you pull your pants up, as long as you, you know, don't Mm -hmm. have any tattoos, as long as you speak proper English, everything will be okay. And the point is like, nah, right. And I think to your point is that we're, we're all on this, this is historic, you know, you talk about, it doesn't have to be that way. I'm thinking of, yeah, local community organizers and, and other folks who are really starting to think and use their imagination or use their imagination and take from the prison abolition movement, imagination to really recreate the societies and spaces that they want. So you're right. So it doesn't have to be that way, but I can't discount that it has been for a lot of people for a long time. And, you know, we're, we're I know I'm going to be, we're going to be fine. I'm going to be fine this when I'm in my old age. And I think my kids, kids and my, and their kids are going to still be fine. I think this is a lifelong struggle and fight to create the kind of spaces in society where that's, that's not the case, you know? Yeah. And importantly, like that space starts in your house, you know, like, it, like, I feel like part of these things have to do like, the relationship that, for example, that I have with my mom, like I can remember like the roots of it, you know, like I can remember the ways that now it's kind of hard for us to exist in a space where we can talk about the ways that we would like to change, the ways that we would like to maybe show up for our, my niece and nephew, maybe show up for, you know, their grandkids in a different way that allows it, it doesn't allow for society and for respectability and for all these naming politics to put such a chasm in the way that we relate to each other. Yeah. And also, and also that mission is a deadly undertaking. Like yeah. what, you're just going to teach your kids, you're just going to stop teaching your kids to be afraid of the police, or you're just going to stop teaching your kids to look, to watch out for themselves, you know? So it's like, I'm wondering, and that's another reason I, I super appreciate the centering of yourself and your like family story in this is because like, how do we relate to each other in a way that's safe for us? Like the bond that we have while also keeping each other safe from all the things that we're talking about needing to be protected from. You know, yeah. like that is like I definitely like bringing ancestors into the room and like bringing like recently passed folks into the room. Like my cousin was was just he just passed away in Pittsburgh through an act of gun violence. And so like it's like mm-hmm. how how in how in mourning his passing, you know, do we fortify the ways that our families need to be together? You know, like the way yeah. that we relate to each other, the way that we, you know, have the best time while we get to spend with each other, you know? Hearing that, um, I'm sorry to hear about your cousin. I, I want to say a couple things like too often. So this is, I'm just, I just heard the language. So I just want to like uh, talk more about it. 
Right, like too often, I feel like people use that logic to undermine policies and practices that support Black folk and their families. Mm-hmm. So I can't tell you how many times, you know, this is historical stuff, like, you know, Pat the Moynihan report in the 60s, right? That's like, mm-hmm. it starts in the home. Like, that, like that's why the Black folks aren't, aren't being successful. And the understanding that, like, people don't exist in vacuums that I like, yeah, I wonder, that's a, I think that's a phenomenal question that you pose, right? How do we do both? And like, yeah, like support, like how do we share space and support one another while then also not just making the focus about us and about, but about systems. And so you guys, you all are educators. And so you might appreciate this, but you know, I was in, I came academic age, I, I, I would say when grit and growth mindset, you know, we're, we're on the yeah. rise and it, I, you know, I, I'll own it. I'll, I was on that train. I was same, like, oh, just, hey, oh, we gonna give interventions here. We gonna do yeah. interventions there. And I realized when I got old, and it, so this is my time in Malaysia, really thinking about my experience. I'm just like, wait, what? Nah, nah, nah. What it's what it does indirectly or directly is problematize the kids, right? The students. Mm. But what we should seek to do is problematize the systems that create those conditions for those kids to do X, whatever, whatever, whatever they want to target, whatever researchers or academics or, you know, toxic teachers want to target. Right. And so I've been on a mission to like focus on like those systems. And that's why I wanted to make sure I talk about like, and this is why I talked, I said at the end of the essay that I don't want to make this about my, well, it's not that I don't want to make it about my dad, but that like, I understand. And that's why I'm not mad. Mm. Like I'm not upset with you and I still love you as your son. And the real problem is not you. I understand that right. it's the, the immigration industrial complex that would allow you to think that what's like, you know, whatever, how you behave and who you are is okay, you know? And yeah. so, so that, so that's really, you know, that once I understood that, that transformed how I thought about approaching this essay for sure, for sure. And it made me, if I'm completely honest, I don't even, my father hasn't read this. I'm like, I'm too scared <laughs> to, to give this to him, you know, like. I don't know how he would react. You heard it here first. So don't go looking for him. Don't send it to him. But um, I'm just dropping, like, you know, just dropping, just heavy stuff on y'all for sure. I really don't, I don't know. And so, but it gave me a vehicle to, to love him more through this essay. Because it did start out as like, a, oh man, you did this, you did this, you did this. And once <laughs> I started thinking about this systems level thinking, it was just like, how can I blame my father for this? Oh this my God. Not him. You know, of course, I, you know, in the end, I say, you, although you do need some good talking to sometimes, you mm-hmm. know, the real problem is these systems. I hope that makes sense. That is definitely one of the things, you know, like, and that's part of like going back to thinking about how the personal is universal. Like, how do we create spaces where these things can even be talked about without some report going and saying, oh, Black people said themselves that they, we wish that we could have closer relationships in the family you know like how do we go about these things and how do we have these conversations in ways that are safe and in ways that we are not twisted around to to represent something that problematizes our resistance and the ways that we have because that's what they came up with grit and growth mindset if that doesn't describe black people I don't know who it describes you know like if they like all what happens is we experience things and they notice and then they turn it into an academic concept that we can no longer access like it's it's the same with gentrification it's the same with appropriation like the ways that we're taking advantage of and then not able to 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 go back and heal the roots like our family roots like it's it's cruel you know and so the the fact that your essay like continuously centers the ways that the relationship like wriggles and does this this dance of like you know tension as an expression of love right? Because if y'all didn't care about each other, like, y'all wouldn't have this, like, going on, you know what I'm saying? And, like, the very fact that your dad could say something like, oh, I choose work over my family, like, hell, people choose work over their family, they're just not honest enough to express that, you know? So, like, I want to know what it would, I want to know what it would look like to, like, in my brain, I want to know what it would look like for you and your dad to have a conversation about this essay, because I'm trying to figure out how to have, you know, hella conversations, trying to write myself, you know, like, what do I get to write about my family, like, without seeming like I'm throwing them under the bus? Yeah, I like, think it is a hard thing. And, you know, I've, like, we've had conversations, for sure, but not about, like, this essay. And we've talked about, like, the whole, that we talked about that moment about going to the, you know, going to the, you know, going to the, going to court, and then 
and then you know still calling me austin you know and why he and why he doesn't want to like call me tyrone we talked about that and those were hard convos and so they've happened and um just not i just haven't said like hey dad i've written about it and 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 put it out for the world to see i don't know how i feel yeah i don't know i have to i have to sit with that for a little bit longer you know about about what that would look like yeah absolutely it's just very very deep you know he could always come to article club you know <laughs> that's funny that's funny yeah i just i mean sarai and i just want to like thank you so much i mean we could just keep on talking your piece is brilliant so, and not so long and here we have been talking for overtime and we didn't even get to like so many of the different things like like education for example and all of the nuance and sophisticated complex feelings you know around education and all these other things too but i don't know it's just like sarai just, sarai and i just want to like deeply deeply thank you for your time. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. I really appreciate y'all reaching out. I'm glad we were able to, to set this up. I really appreciate it. Yet again, Tyrone, thank you so much for being on Article Club. One more time, I'd like to thank Tyrone Florizard for saying yes to Article Club. Thank you so much, Tyrone, for generously sharing your thoughts on your outstanding essay. Also, I'd like to thank you all for listening to this episode of Article Club, and I welcome you to join a discussion whenever you feel inspired and comfortable. We're a reading community of kind, thoughtful people who like to get into great articles and talk about them and be moved by them. So if this is interesting to you, but you're on the fence and not quite sure, please reach out to me at mark at highlighter.cc. All right, I hope you have a great week.